parks throughout that domain from the Hudson Highlands to New York City that benefited mightily from New Deal work in the 1930s. When we were canoeing on the Hudson River or picking on its banks during my childhood, my father, an, an ardent New Deal Democrat, would sometimes credit all that we enjoyed to the New Deal. That was a touch generous. The Palisades Interstate Park system that you see here in this map, rendered in 1965, encompassed both the bank of the Hudson River in New Jersey and lands in the Hudson Highlands further north in New York State. But in truth, the Palisades Interstate Park System dates to 1900 and efforts to preserve the Palisades from quarrying. The Palisades are a majestic line of cliffs in New Jersey, towering over the west banks of the Hudson River. And to have those cliffs preserved and to have parklands at their base preserved was a tremendous recreational resource for people not only in New Jersey, but also in New York City. Substantial improvements to the Palisades interstate park system took place in the 1920s, but the New Deal did dramatically improve lands in the system and also had tremendous impact in New York City. In New York City, massive public pools, playgrounds, and Central Park and more were the beneficiaries of New Deal labor and New Deal funds. These facilities are still used in New York City today. The New Deal stressed active recreation and the healthy benefits of the outdoors. In Harriman State Park in the Hudson Highlands, next to Bear Mountain, Baki Swamp was dammed and reborn as Silver Mine Lake, pictured here. And the area became a center for skiing. Adjacent to the lake was a woods road that was and is excellent for backcountry skiing, snowshoeing, and hiking. A ski slope was built there by the New Deal, and I learned to ski there in the 1970s. Sadly, the ski hill was shut down amid budget cuts in the 1980s. New Deal workers also built the cafe that still graces the state line between New York and New Jersey atop the Palisades. Next to the cafe are trails built by the New Deal that are used today for running, walking, and cross-country skiing. Restored picnic tables at a New Deal site by the Hudson River are maintained, even though it's difficult and expensive to maintain old facilities built as long ago as the 1930s. Nevertheless, New Deal facilities are still standing alongside the Hudson River, like this pavilion and alpine that was built by New Deal workers, and they're available for picnics, parties, and folk dancing here at the pavilion. In New York City, New Deal facilities still enrich Central Park, and municipal pools in the 1980s and 1990s undermined by budget cuts and worse are today important sites for public recreation. If you see the movie In the Heights, you'll recognize this pool in a tremendous scene in that film. The New York City branch of the Living New Deal, a nonprofit dedicated to mapping the physical le legacy of FDR's New Deal, has mounted red, white, and blue medallions as a one-year honorary display at WP8 pools that were completed in New York City in the summer of 1936. NYC Parks has written new and updated historical sign narratives for each WP8 pool. The narratives are being posted on the site at, at nyc.gov slash parks. There are really extraordinary history of an extraordinary infrastructure of parks that was built by the New Deal and is still in use today. You look for these red medallions if you're at a municipal pool because they'll tell you that you're at a site that was put together with the hard work of the New Deal. Today we'll hear from two authorities on the distant and recent past on our parks and the New York metropolitan area and the relationship to the New Deal. These parks are a part of our history, but they're also an inheritance to care for today. First, we're going to hear from Marta Gutman on the topic of race, space, and play, Robert Moses and the WPA swimming pools in New York City. Marta, a historian and licensed architect, teaches architectural and urban history at the Spitzer School of Architecture at the City College of New York and at the Graduate Center of CUNY. She's the author of the prize-winning book, a City for Children, Women, Architecture, and the Charitable Landscapes of Oakland, 1850 to 1950. Her current book project 
is just space, modern architecture, publication, public education, and school desegregation in post-war urban America. Mart is a founding editor of Platform, the online forum for conversations about buildings, spaces, and landscapes. She's also the president-elect of the Society for American City and Regional Planning History. After Mart has spoken, we'll hear from Rose Harvey on the subject of parks and policy moving forward, lessons and gifts from the New Deal. I was reminded of Rose's good works when I was hiking over the last weekend at Bear Mountain, and as I stepped onto the major Welch Trail, I saw this sign noting her good works as commissioner of New York State Parks. Rose, senior fellow, Parks and Open Space, leads New City Parks, a program at Regional Plan Association to create and revitalize parks in neighborhoods that lack green spaces. Before joining RPA as commissioner of the Office of New York State Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation, she oversaw the revitalization, creation, and operations of more than 250 parks and historic sites and helped create and execute Governor Andrew Cuomo's $1 billion Parks 2020 Capital Improvement Program to rejuvenate and transform the New York State Park system. At the Trust for Public Land, she helped establish over $1 billion in new parks, 300 of which are urban gardens and playgrounds in underserved neighborhoods. Rose holds a BA from Colorado College and an MES from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. So we'll start with Marta and then we'll go over to Rose. Marta. Okay, I need to share my screen, right? You're up. Waiting for the PowerPoint to open. Well, maybe I'll just do it myself then. Okay. There we go. No, I opened it. All right. Good. Great. Okay. So thanks, Rob. And uh, I'll read my talk to make sure that we I stick to time. So on June 24th, 1936, thousands of cheering New Yorkers gathered on the Lower East Side to celebrate the opening of this new public swimming pool in Hamilton Fish Park. It was the first imprint in a $10 million public works project, public works project that by the end of the summer modernized the aquatic landscape across the city. Funded by the Works Progress Administration, the WPA pools opened once a week starting in Manhattan. Then in Queens, where the Astoria Park Pool and Bathhouse opened in conjunction with the Triborough Bridge. Then in Staten Island, where the Tompkinsville Pool was built near the railroad tracks. Then in the Bronx, near in Crotona Park. This is where Marshall Berman learned to swim. And finally in Brooklyn, where the new recreation center, the last one to open in 1936, was located in a new public park and adjacent to Red Hook Houses, all three projects built by the WPA. By the end of the summer, 11 new pools had been built, one had been renovated, and more than 1,790,000 people swam in them. 600,000 were children under the age of 14, attracted by free swims on weekday mornings. Robert Moses, the Parks Commissioner, worked with Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia to bring this grand civic improvement to fruition in record time. Fortune magazine touted the achievement as, quote, a conspicuous example of the social div dividend, close quote, ple pledged by Fra President Franklin D. Roosevelt for the New Deal. The photo of Moses that illustrated the Fortune article showed him to be a model public servant of his time, smiling in shirt sleeves and very successful with important WPA projects highlighted on the map behind him. And then also I'm here showing the map that the Living New Deal has made of uh, New York, of the improvements of the New Deal in New York overall. The New Deal remade New York City, uh, as these maps show, and as Mason B. Williams explains in City of Ambition, FDR, LaGuardia, and the Making of Modern New York. And my summary is drawn from the review of Williams's book in the New York Times. So the Public Works Administration spent $58 per capita in New York City, 
about $1,000 in today's funds, which was triple the per capita figure in Philadelphia or Detroit. The spending of the Works Progress Administration made up 31.4% of the municipal budget in 1937. And that spending meant that during the heyday of the New Deal, more than one in 11 New York City workers was employed by the New Deal, either directly or on a WPA project. So friendly visage aside, Moses had no qualms about manipulating, even flouting the conventions of democratic politics to achieve his goals. In 1938, he succeeded in nullifying a proposed amendment to the New York State Constitution that would have allowed the state government to battle racial discrimination in the private sector. This ugly side of the Moses phenomenon, stressed by Robert Caro in The Power Broker, leads to the serious charge that Moses was motivated by racism with respect to the magnificent pools you've just seen. So Caro targets these pools, Thomas Jefferson Park Pool on the left in Italian East Harlem and Colonial Park Pool on the right in what whites called Black or Dark Harlem in the 1930s. I agree Moses was a racial conservative he endorsed separate and equal as a practical political philosophy, but Caro's charges do not hold up under close scrutiny of the physical city. So this evening, I'll share a revisionist perspective on swimming, architecture, race, and childhood that I developed in working on Robert Moses in the Modern City, and I showed you the catalog cover just a few slides ago, and one that I believe is important to share again in light of the renewed calls for racial justice in our country. I'll compare these pools to show how centralized planning and standardization made separate but and equal a tangible reality for children in neighborhoods hard hit by the depression. In addition, I'll show that some of the new WPA, pool, WPA pools were racially integrated in the 1930s and 1940s. So just to say that the impact of New Deal reform on children and recreation in New York City was exceptional, given that black and white children typically benefited unequally from the w WPA programs in other cities. So yet, Jeff Wiltsey, author of A Social History of Public Pools, uses this poster as proof that the color line divided, divided pools in New York City. In some pools it did, but his reading misses other important points. The first is that this poster shows that both black, both black and white children were welcome in the instructional program and thus in the water of at least some city pools. In addition, and in defiance of racist stereotypes, black and white youngsters are shown to be clean and healthy and to benefit equally from public programs like swimming intended to promote citizenship and public health. John Wagner, a graphic artist working for the poster division of the Federal Art Project, a WPA program designed it. In other cities, other American cities, whites succeeded in segregating public pools, playing on racist fears of body contact, dirt, disease, and race mixing, a euphemism for interracial sex. In St. Louis, this pool in Marquette Park and another one in Fairgrounds Park set the standard for the pool building craze that swept across the US during the 1920s. However, the water quality in this and other progressive era pools was problematic at best. In St. Louis, swimmers swam in untreated river, river water at a time when raw sewage was routinely dumped in the boundary water, waters of cities. And as you see, newspapers reported attempts to purify the water in public swimming pools. According to this article, it took all summer in 1931. In New York, kids swam in polluted river water and cooled off in fire hydrant spray to cope with the heat. The first was dangerous. 450 people drowned in the city in 1934 alone, and none were sanitary. Remember, this is a pre-vaccine era. Polio was just one of many diseases that kids could catch by swimming or playing in dirty water, and New York was no exception to the practice of dumping untreated sewage into the, river, the boundary waters of the city. So anxiety about dirt and disease coupled with angst about adolescent sexuality 
was coupled with angst about adolescent sexuality. In New York, more boys than girls swam historically, and the gender skew persisted in New Deal pools. Although parents did not always prevail in intergenerational conflict in immigrant families, domestic duties restricted the time all girls had available for recreation, including for swimming. So the need for change was clear to Mayor LaGuardia, who appointed Robert Moses commissioner of the new citywide parks department right after he took office on January 1st, 1934. By the summer, the new Moses team had developed a plan to build 23 pools across the city. In six months, they did this. It was announced in the New York Times and illustrated with the model design you see here, rendered by the architect Theo Kowski. And in the end, the scope of work was cut back, but the achievement was nonetheless astonishing. So the key to success was standardization. By this term, I mean standard components and construction details, not design, because each pool was a unique work of public architecture. To summarize, the Parks Department developed a standard bathhouse design, a standard site plan with three in-ground reinforced concrete pools, the largest used for swimming, some were at Olympic size, the smaller ones for wading and diving. Standard construction details and mechanical systems, including for water treatment, and a standard attitude toward location. To avoid delays, the pools were sited on available open space and near civic amenities, usually dating to the progressive era. So let's turn to our comparison. And I show you the uh, location of both pools um, on the, uh, their highlight, their, the locations are highlighted on the aerial photo. So we're starting at Jefferson Park because this pool was rendered notorious by the charge in the power broker that Moses ordered the water unheated. According to an aide, he believed that Puerto Rican and other and African Americans disliked swimming in cold water. And the person who's unidentified is reported to have stated, quote, while heating plants at other swimming pools kept the water at a comfortable 70 degrees, at Thomas Jefferson Pool, the water was left unheated, close quote. The charge has been interpreted to mean either that the mechanical equipment wasn't used or that the mechanical equipment wasn't provided to heat water for swimmers. I do not dispute that white control of Jefferson Park Pool buttressed white racial privilege in East Harlem. However, the former interpretation of the nasty story about water temperature is not seconded by other sources and the latter is refuted by the design of the pool. So the siting of the new pool integrated WP, WPA architecture into a reform landscape of an earlier time. The small park that was opened during the progressive era in the part of East Harlem called Little Italy and that Italian immigrants claimed and defended as white territory before the new facility was built. And you can see the um, Thomas Jefferson Park with great bath with great recreation center, uh, um, recreation pavilion in the aerial photo. In 1930, 78% of East Harlem residents were foreign born with waves of successive migration rendering this community ethnically complex. As Robert Orsi has shown during the Great Depression, Southern Italians, Puerto Ricans and Southern Blacks became caught up in quote, a desperate mapping of American identities, close quote, based on gradations of skin color. Lexington Avenue marked the edge of Italian and Black Harlem in the 1930s. And as Orsi writes, if the boundary was crossed, it was done intentionally, he argues, with the transgressor fully aware that conflict would erupt when this border was violated. Stanley Brogren, 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 sorry, the architect in charge of the design of the pool placed the new complex right in the middle of the park. Thronged with thousands on opening day, the pool and the bathhouse won praise from Lewis Mumford as an example of sound vernacular modern architecture and other critics applauded the use of simple materials simply disposed. The monumental clarity of the above ground world was rivaled by the complexity of the underground world. A system of filter beds, pipes, and other equipment 
assured clean, sanitary, and heated water at all sites, including at Jefferson. Clean water was usually part of the WPA vision for swimming, but heating water in outdoor pools used in the summer wasn't common at all. However, Moses insisted the amenity, warm water, be added to city pools. The same points about design excellence hold for Colonial, now Jackie Robinson Pool in central Harlem. This pool was supposed to have been built in Mount Morris, now Marcus Garvey Park, but after the Harlem uprising of 1935, the mayor changed the site to Colonial Park within the boundaries of the so-called Dark Harlem. On the evening of August 9th, 1935, LaGuardia visited the park with Moses. There was a great outdoor dance taking place sponsored by the Parks Department, and they announced a new pool and recreation center would be built there. After decades of neglect, Colonial Park was in terrible condition. At least uh, there was an underground stream uh, um, that turned the site into a muddy mess, and at least some, in, and in the reconstruction, at least some of the laborers hired by the WPA were African American, and they rebuilt the park entirely, adding new playgrounds, a baseball diamond, other athletic fields, a band shell and dance floor, as well as the new pool and, and bathhouse. And you can see the, the layout of this long, thin park along the ridge uh, that runs through northern Manhattan, um, upper Manhattan, uh, that was re uh, published in the Times. So Amar Embry produced a stellar design for the bathhouse and pool enclosure, coordinated architecturally with other buildings in the park. Much bigger than Jefferson Pool, the center accommodated 4,100 swimmers, and the two-story brick bathhouse recalled medieval uh, and Roman architecture. This is a view by uh, uh, Andrew Moore of the entry lobby. So given the neighborhoods were built, it's not surprising that white kids swam in Jefferson and black kids swam in Colonial. But the question remains, did Moses build these pools to imprint his racist vision on children and the city's public spaces? He explained the decision otherwise at a lecture at Harvard University in 1939, insisting that separate and equal was the pragmatic solution of a political conservative, I hate him, to what he called uh, racial problems. As I explain in more detail elsewhere, whites routinely built beat up blacks and Puerto Ricans in East Harlem when they tried to swim in Jefferson Pool. On occasion, whites swam in Colonial Pool, although others felt unwelcome. The line was hardening between black and white in New York City, even as the city became a racially, a more racially diverse and complicated uh, place. So this discussion could stop here at these two pools and with the civil servant reluctant to integrate an unwilling community. But that would leave analysis of the topic incomplete. That is without mention of the WPA pools that were racially integrated under Moses's tenure during the New Deal. So the most interesting example is Betsy Head Recreation Center in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Another example of the decision to invest WPA dollars in a park in need of repair and a community hard hit by the depression. When Betsy Head Memorial Park opened in the progressive era, Brownsville was a predominantly white Jewish working class neighborhood. By the mid 1930s, African Americans also called this community home. The park equipped with a bathhouse and pool in 1914 had been singled out in the regional plan as in need of improvement and was described by Moses subsequently as in disgraceful condition. After a fire reduced all to ruins in 1937, the parks department put John Matthews Hatton in charge and he produced this extraordinary building. The new bathhouse with the requisite three pools opened in 1939. At first, I believed the informal rules mentioned by Christopher Gree when I met him at the park, um, I believe in 2006, segregated the pool in the 1930s. His stories were seconded by reports of racial exclusion in the park in Wendell Pritchett's Brownsville, Brooklyn, and this 1949-41 article in Architectural Record, and the photos taken by Samuel Gatto show the pool full of white people. So this article celebrated the architectural quality of the facility, 
calling attention to the daring cantilever canopy supported by eight parabolic arches clad in aluminum at, that covered the roof deck stadium of the sleek new bathhouse. You can imagine my surprise when I realized that Gacho photographed the pool on July 14th, 1940, 1939, not in 1941, and he took many more images than were published. They give a different impression of space and society in the Brownsville pool, one in keeping with the progressive, dare I say, radical politics that Pritchett reports survived, albeit only for a time and among some people as Southern black migrants moved into a very left-wing Jewish community. Uh, in fact, there's some thought that Moses held off um, improving the park at, um, improving Betsy Head Park because he so disavowed the politics of the neighborhood. Um, in any event, uh, in this pool, swimming, racial integration and experimentation with gender norms and sexuality were not mutually exclusive. Gacho shows the pool to be not only a place where children played, but a center of courtship, spectacle, and display where the sons and daughters of immigrants tried out and on new Americanized uh, selves. And these photographs of older immigrant women and their younger American daughters, I think, tell the story uh, beautifully, depict the, depict the point beautifully. Um, more to the point, the unpublished photos show the pool at Betsy Head Park was racially integrated. Black and white kids lined up at the entry, separated by sex, as was common practice, but not by race. They gathered on the pool deck, they used the water, and in fact, children seem relatively indifferent to the issue of race. So their familiarity with one another is seconded by other stories of racial integration, especially in boys' team sports at this park. As astonishing, uh, um, the Brownsville Boys Club softball team was racially integrated. As astonishing are the photos that show the park department condoned racial tolerance and dare I say supported it by integrating the lifeguard staff. Is this situation an example of flagging? Carol used the term to describe the hiring of white lifeguards at Jefferson Pool, reportedly at Moses' insistence to dissuade blacks from swimming there. Perhaps the reverse happened at Betsy Head Pool, a tacit recognition of a different social situation. And one that existed at McCarran Park Pool in Brooklyn and at Highbridge Park Pool in Manhattan in the 1930s, the 1940s, and into the 1950s. In other American cities, the prospect of racially integrated swimming sparked violent protest. In St. Louis, the WPA pools were separate and not equal and racially segregated by law. Maplewood Pool on the top left was one of two white only municipal pools built in St. Louis County with WPA funds. In the city proper, the WPA helped build Tandy Recreation Center on the lower left in a black neighborhood. It had a small indoor pool, not a big outdoor one. Some federal money was allocated to improve outdoor pools, including at Fairgrounds Park. African Americans pressed for access, leading to the infamous incident in 1949 when white teenagers brutally attacked black boys trying to integrate the pool. The story made national news with Life Magazine giving full play to the brutality of the white teenagers and also endorsing the mayor's solution. He closed the pool and reinstituted racial segregation at other sites. One year later, when the city complied with a federal court order to integrate, the mayor opened the pools to boys and girls on alternate days to, alle to alleviate what Joseph Heathcott has called, quote, white fears of sexual mixing of the races, unquote. So clearly there are many stories to tell about the WPA swimming pools, the great new spaces of public informality built across New York City during the New Deal. In East Harlem, Central Harlem, Brownsville, and other neighborhoods hard hit by the depression and undergoing demographic change, hundreds of thousands of boys flocked to these stellar works of public architecture, exemplars of the New Deal vision of modern childhood. Was this pragmatic liberalism unique to New York? I'm quite confident it was during the New Deal. 
it, I'm quite confident it was, and that it lasted for the New Deal and, and, and not for a whole lot longer. It's clear that the WPA swimming pools remained treasured recreational resources as support for racial integration waned in the neighborhoods discussed this evening. And during the 1950s, fistfights broke out between young men on the pool decks and in locker rooms at Highbridge Park Pool, um, especially when ethnic and racial divides were crossed in teenage dating. This pool was so highly valued that teenage, uh, teenage gangs fighting over turf in Washington Heights committed a terrible murder just outside of it, one that Robert Bob Snyder, our moderator, has written eloquently about. And similar battles happened between whites and blacks at McCarran Park Pool and between Puerto Ricans and Italians at Jefferson Park Pool. So in closing, I'd like to return to the point, some points I made at the beginning of my presentation. The first and most obvious is that Caro's charges do not hold up under historical scrutiny of the physical city. The biographer's focus on personality comes at great cost. It distracts from the spatial and structural dynamics of racism. Yes, it is important to set the record straight on Moses. It's more important to recognize that racism is more powerful than any one individual, even a man as powerful as Robert Moses. The cold water story is reprehensible, but the flip side of it is the suggestion that heating the water would have mitigated race prejudice at Jefferson Park Pool. A water temperature was more or less a trivial matter in the face of routine violence used to halt racial integration of swimming pools on some, some, in some of New York neighborhoods and across the United States more generally. The second point is the need to insert race, childhood, and architecture into the history of the New Deal. This is an important project in and of itself. It is also useful to imagining roots to a more democratic, anti-racist future. Skeptics may doubt the New Deal vision of urban recreation and modern childhood, especially the intent to link space, play, and citizenship. They argue play is better left alone because play mirror mirrors reality, it reflects the state of society, and the government, you know the excuses. I've drawn other conclusions from probing race, place, and play in the WPA pools. No space is intrinsically free, but modern architecture was a key mechanism for shaping a better social world during the New Deal. Some kids, these kids, took a chance at the new pools. Historical actors in their own rights, in their own right, black and white boys and girls swam together in neighborhoods where progressive New Yorkers worked to make racial integration a matter of fact in daily life, not only an abstract principle. In magnificent new public places, children cut across gender, age, and racial lines in progressive ways, showing that democratic citizenship could grow through their play during the WPA. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Welcome. <laughs> and now we'll hear from Rose on a more recent past. Uh, let's see. And I, I think we've got to go back to the beginning on this. I'm just sharing my screen. Do you have it, Jamie? Okay, I'm not going to uh, share it. I'm just going to go ahead. 
And um, hello, I'm Rose Harvey, and uh, I am uh, the executive director of New City Parks and a senior fellow at RPA that's incubating uh, New City Parks. And the concept of New City Parks is to create parks in small cities, in low-income communities and communities of color. And just a little background on why uh, we've created New City Parks will give you a little insight as to uh, the perspective of this commissioner, Rose Harvey, and probably all the commissioners before me and the, uh, my successor, Eric, Pulisade, who's the current commissioner of New, uh, of New York State Parks. And that is that parks are essential to your human health, your mental health, physical health, to your social well being, your environment, and to building your community. And uh, with that, also, as you cross uh, pretty much the country, uh, new studies have shown that in low-income communities and communities of color, that in fact their park system, compared to their more affluent uh, city citizens, are half as small, five times as more visited, and I can tell you from my field studies, that uh, are probably one one-hundredth of the quality that you see. So with that background, I'm going to just give you a quick run through on where New York State Parks has been and continues to move forward. And just so you know, New York State Park System is really the second largest park system in the country. Um, and also, so you kind of get a sense of the importance of state parks. Uh, the state parks throughout the country are two and a half times the visitation of the National Park Service. And New York State, California, and Alaska comprise 45% of all the state acreage. And um, as well, it, you, as you see, Niagara Falls State Park, which is, I don't know, 130 acres, is greater than that of Grand Canyon Yosemite, and Yosemite combined. As well, we talked a little bit already with the Palisades, but uh, uh, our park system is a historic park system. Niagara Falls is the nation's oldest state park system, uh, park and Washington headquarters was the first publicly owned historic site in the country. And the Palisades Park Commission we talked about, it was set up in the 1900s with private donations and, um, uh, was though it is not the oldest part of the New York State Park System, it was close to being the oldest and by far the largest in earlier days. And then of course, Jones Beach State Park opened and remains one of the largest public recreational beaches in the world. Uh, FDR uh, left us a huge legacy and uh, he left us the CCC, as Robert uh, talked about. We were one of the um, uh, largest contingent of CCC camps. Uh, we had 68 camps uh, between its history, which was 1933 to 1942. We had 221,000 young men who rebuilt our part, New York State park system, but also then were paid um, and sent back uh, those paychecks to support their families in the midst of the depression. There, uh, you know, you saw in the Palisades, the work was remarkable. Uh, believe it or not, um, they did more work in upstate New York, in central New York, in Niagara, than in the Palisades and also in the Taconic but it was everything. The stonework you saw, the cabins. I don't know if anybody knows the children's camps in Harriman, um, but uh, they built most of the cabins, most of the cribs, most of the beaches for it. All of the stone stairways that you see throughout our state parks. 
Uh, FDR also left a uh, legacy of conservation. Um, and that was all about, at the time, and who's surprised given uh, the Dust Bowl uh, prior to the Depression, but it was in, in New York State, uh, the CCC planted a million trees and actually uh, provided insect control over 3.7 million acres in New York State. And insect control will be and is very important in our climate change work uh, in our parks. So we're repeating much of the same. And then finally, what Marta said a little bit is the whole notion of eliminating children uh, work laws and talking about children should play and learn. And you're gonna see as we go forward, we have many programs uh, that reflect that. So part priorities, uh, in my time, I served in, from 2011 and, and I should mention quickly Four Freedoms State Park I, on Roosevelt Island uh, Louis Kahn's architecture, I think you all know, and we can uh, go into any detail later. But the park priorities um, are, were when in 2011, I served from 2011 to 2019 under Governor Cuomo, was fixing and transforming a completely deteriorated and broken park system that had no capital at the time. It's increasing, deepening and improving the visitor experience primarily for all, safe, affordable and accessible to all. And then our resiliency, our sustainability, environmental stewardship, it, it's about climate change. Um, it's about adaptability and, um, and it continues much as it di did under FDR and has over the long term. And then operational efficiency and sustainability. Uh, I'm just gonna talk briefly about that, but uh, it's really important. State parks don't get a lot of operational money. If you build it, can you maintain it? And um, if, I'm gonna talk a little bit about partnerships. And then we were parks, recreation, historic preservation preserving, celebrating our history and restoration of our historic art architecture was always a goal. To the point of uh, revitalizing, restoring and transforming, uh, we initiated under Governor Cuomo a 900 million, it turned out to be a billion dollar uh, capital program to improve and um, revitalize all our sites. And in 19, 2011, the state park system had a billion dollar backlog, 40 years of nothing coming from the state capital budget for the deteriorating facilities and 99 parks proposed for closure in 2011. And just to give you context, uh, this was similar in many park systems, including our sister agency, California, uh, the largest uh, state park system. So in the revitalization, uh, which pretty much started in 2012, we looked at our flagship parks, but we also looked at those parks that would serve those communities that couldn't easily get to a park near where they lived. And interesting, we focus on 30 flagship and under certain parks that would serve underserved communities. And that uh, comprised 80% of our attendance. Jones Beach continues, it's continuing a $65 million revitalization of all the Robert Moses beach houses, pool houses, uh, all, it was uh, magnificent architecture. Roberto Clemente in Morris Heights, South Bronx, $60 million revitalization. And just quickly, uh, this is a, a, a citing of uh, our environmental stewardship. That park was rustic, closed, gym closed. And uh, it had a bulkhead that was about, uh, had 90% compromised, Sandy hit 
and it was a wall. The walk had walled the park off from the Harlem River. And we uh, used HUD money under Sandy to do a state of the art a bulkhead that allowed the river to come to the to the river to the park's edge and also attenuate any rise. Um, also uh, continued uh, renovation, transformation, Riverbank State Park off the sewage sewage treatment plant, Rockland Lake State Pools, all of which were closed or about to close. Alana Historic Site, which had 40 leaks with the Frederick Church paintings still in the home, and then the Harriman State Park cabins were part of the FDR legacy, and we focused of the hundred that were established at the time of the Palisades, really 23 were left. And of those, we focus on 17 and are slowly but surely rebuilding them and restoring them. And then for Robert's sake, I just want you to know that Sebago Lake is going to come back with a new pool house. It's been closed for many, many years. And I know that I knew that would make you happy. <laughs> if you build it, will they come? Um, you don't know. Uh, it's it's a new generation. It's an urban generation. It's a generation that doesn't have familiarity with the land. It's a generation that uh, doesn't have ancestors who maybe came from the land. And so nature is can be scary, or you may not have the skills to go into uh, nature. And so we first, as we built focused uh, certainly on also access for those communities that can't afford to buy a car. So public transportation, we subsidize regional bus services. So you can get close to Jones Beach, but you can't quite get there. State Park subsidizes a bus, a regional bus system to service public. We work with Amtrak for whistle stops. So Breakneck Ridge Trail, a top 10 trail in the Hudson River Valley has a whistle stop by Amtrak. And with that whistle stop comes a thousand uh, hikers every weekend. And in an upstate, we have regional bus services. Uh, so the communities that don't have cars and need them to get there can access their parks. But more importantly, is the deeper, uh, the how do we build the skills? How do we make people, and particularly children, interested in, uh, in the environment and help create um, uh, their own land ethic through the use and experience of nature? So we initiated Connect Kids as we were rebuilding parks. The, there are many components of Connect Kids, but uh, first was uh, a free bus for all Title I schools, a quick application. State parks would pay for the buses, and then we would uh, basically uh, provide environmental centers and uh, rangers to help teach classes when they would arrive. And, we, in four years, increased uh, students. This is school children, not all children. We had a 75,000 uh, 75, children attending and coming to parks as school children. And we increased that to 500,000 and it's about 700,000 now. And when we built our, our, our parks and revitalized them, we did a map of all our parks that were adjacent to urban areas um, and Title I schools. And we built 31 new nature centers that would be accessible to the kids uh, from these Title I schools. And with partners and rangers provided environmental education programs. And I have Ganondagan which is south of Rochester on the lower part, which is a, a new, it's the Seneca Art and Culture Center. 
so that we could also bring in art and cultural activities that reflected the communities that surrounded um, our state parks. And that was funded by the Seneca Nation and some private foundations. Also, um, learn to swim uh, in FDR's uh, time and uh, continues uh, at state parks and New York City parks. New York State Parks has, uh, I think, 5,000 lifeguard saves a year, mainly from urban children who don't have the opportunity to learn how to swim. We could have put in more lifeguards, but we decided we needed to teach the skills that children need to not only use pools, but our beaches and our uh, lake fronts. So uh, we have now tens of thousands of children uh, who take in the summer free swim lessons to teach them to swim and also give them the comfort to move on and move forward. And I also wanna say Marta, uh, it's very interesting. We had mainly uh, boys and we couldn't figure out why. And actually it's about knowing your community. Our lifeguards were reflective of our community and they explained that, that girls cultures, religions, Yep. Uh, races uh, made hair, wet hair, hair. Uh, uh, an issue. And we worked with the American Red Cross and came up with better uh, swim caps. And we're now about 50-50 in terms of, of attendance. That's great. We also have our own CCC. Uh, the governor uh, named it the Excelsior Conservation Corps after New York State. And it uh, reflected much of the, it in fact, was based on research of FDR's CCC, the WPA CCC. It's actually, it says here 50 full time, it's about 100. We, we want to double, triple it, as does the current commissioner, 18 to 25 year olds. We give them board, we give them room, we give them those stipends that were so important in the original CCC. And we also give them training. Uh, training not only for just parks projects that improve our parks mightily, but you see solar panels, um, you see carpentry, uh, also electric, so that these could be job skills that could be translated into working wages, whether in or outside of our parks. And with all of this, all of it's done um, with friends and partners. And, um, it, it, and I talked a little bit about operations and uh, our budget. And you know, the state parks budget is about 200 million a year. It's a fraction of a one percent of the uh, of the full state budget. But uh, all park operational budgets all across the country are the first to be cut. And so what we need to do is be efficient um, and, and also bring in partners. And I, what we've done is, and what was being done before I arrived and what is being done by Eric Kulise, the current commissioner, is we've created maintenance uh, pools of maintenance dollars so that we can maintain the very basics. But we look to partners to help program the sites. And as you program and as you bring in more people to your parks, you, you actually decrease in many ways safety issues and stewardship issues. Um, and what we don't have is the ability to do all the programming at all of our parks. And so we bring in partners. So what you have here is a view of the Horticultural Society, Riverbank State Park that come uh, almost every day and teach cooking and gardening lessons with our community gardens. You have the Appalachian Mountain Club um, at Harriman that's not here but who built, uh, re restored one of our Harriman State Parks. 
And um, you've got New York, New Jersey Trail Conference that also restored another one of the uh, Harriman Children's Parks. But New York, New Jersey Trail Conference acts as stewards because suddenly we have a thousand people getting off the whistle stop for Breakneck Ridge. Many who don't know how to hike, they help to do the stewards <laughs> and they build and maintain most of our trails in the uh, Palisades and also starting to do so in the Taconic. I talked about the American Red Cross, Major League Baseball, Roberto Clemente, aptly named, it's about baseball. We built three new baseball fields. The American um, uh, Major League Baseball basically runs summer programs to teach kids, boys and girls, how to play baseball, they tutor in the process, and they fund the whole thing. Um, it's all, also with friends and partnerships, we have 80 friends groups statewide associated with each of our parks. Over, a, and we did research on, and on how much each of these groups give, and 30 of uh, our friends group Give, gave over the last six years, 141 million to state parks. Some was for uh, revitalization and restoration. Um, some was for uh, programs, to run the programs and to hire the staff to run their programs. And uh, I mentioned, I showed you a picture of Alana that we fixed and we'll always do the basic maintenance but the Alana partnership does the curation um, and uh, also does the tours for uh, Alana is a three-dimensional landscape canvas so uh, the outdoor tours for Freedoms Conservancy they with the Ambassador Vanden Heuvel at the helm raised the 40 million to build the memorial and they help to steward it. And um, it just, the list goes on and on and on. And finally, um, just volunteers who come in every day, not necessarily organized. Um, I love my park days. It was started by Governor Cuomo. Uh, you know, any, this is just one day, you'll get um, 8,000 across the, or, or in one day you'll get a thousand and uh, the number of volunteers has gone up to 8,000. And I'll end with, uh, in terms of volunteerism, de Tocqueville, you know, observing our very young democracy. He, I'm gonna paraphrase, but he basically said, you know, our genius, America's genius or Hulk lay in the fondness of volunteer associations. And he talked about, well, when a bridge needed to be built, the volunteers built them. When trails needed direction, volunteers marked them. When seeds needed to be sowed, the gardens blossomed. So uh, in conclusion, uh, New York State is transforming its state park system uh, through my tenure in previous tenures and um, going forward uh, with Governor Cuomo being a huge, huge driving force in and having this happen. And um, it's, it's an amazing system that everybody should get out into. And so I will end with that. Thank you very much, Rose. Thank you, Marta. Thank you both for, you know, for really extraordinary presentations that that tell us all a lot. Let me just ask each of you one, one brief question to dry, dry to sort of draw out your collective wisdom. Marta, listening to Rose's presentation, where do you hear echoes of the New Deal? Where do you hear departures from the New Deal? I hear echoes from the New Deal all over the place. <laughs> I, I can't say that I hear so many departures, but um, mm -hmm. but I, I was so struck with your comment, Rose, about in. The, the terrible condition that um, state parks, the terrible condition of the state parks and the ways in which you, you working with Governor Cuomo 
uh, invested money needed needed to maintain and rehabilitate them. And that's exactly what happened in New York in 1932, 1934, um, when, you know, the city was starved for cash, right? The banks wouldn't lend any money, you know, FDR plowed millions and millions of dollars into New York City so much that it was understood to be um, the, 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 the next state uh, in terms of funding and um, and the money went to rebuild it went to went to renovate it went to restore Central Park to its glory and then to add uh, all the new all the new settings uh, that some of which you mentioned some of which I mentioned some of which Rob mentioned and all of and of course with the New Deal the point being um, that the end goal was uh, was employment right you know that, that and, and I'm not and I guess that's perhaps where the departure point comes uh, in thinking about uh, Governor Cuomo's plan for the parks is that we wonder, I wonder to what degree it's a program driven by the need to get people working or a program uh, driven by the need to fix an infrastructure that's been, been neglected in, in, um, in the New Deal, the two were linked hand over, hand over fist. I also have other things to say about swimming and instruction, but I'll, I'll leave it there for the now. Uh, the, the New York State Parks uh, contributes mightily to the economy and to jobs um, in New York State. And um, I don't have it, basically, uh, after more people came, so uh, the attendance of New York State Parks since 2011 has increased about 34% to about 79 million. And uh, basically, we then did an economic study, and uh, what happens is the more people come for all the surrounding towns, it increases tourism, it increases the, uh, the jobs for restaurants, hotels, and um, it increased, I think, 4.9 billion to the GNP, and um, I can't remember the number of jobs, but many, many, many jobs. So, um, and much of that is salaries, uh, you know, associated with all of the ripple effect of uh, increased attendance, better parks, more people coming, more people using. And uh, also just to as well in these parks, I talked about all our partners, but there are many, we own three hotels, four hotels. Those are run by concessions. Um, and those are salaries and money going back, you know, going into many people's pockets. So it is continuing big time. Thank you. Rose, I was struck by how much work you do to raise, did do to raise money for the park system. How many partners you had to cultivate to get things done. What do you think it would take to get more direct public spending on parks? Well, in, in terms of the, of the capital, I, I just want to say it's really Governor Cuomo uh, who put in the 1.2. It's, it's right now the capital improvements on the ground are 1.2 billion. And no governor uh, after Nelson Roosevelt had put any. Nelson money. Rockefeller, right? Sorry. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nelson. That's Rockefeller. a very interesting Thank slip. <laughs> um, um, so they, uh, you know, that was a bold move. On the operation side of it, uh, you, it, it, it is something that plagues every park system uh, throughout and parks is not taking disproportionate cuts uh, from any of the other agencies, but when times are tough, agency, agencies get cut. So, but uh, in terms of raising money uh, for that, I would say what de Tocqueville said is the, the genius of volunteerism and the energy of the volunteers and our friends who, um, who aligned with us and, and then raised money uh, to make it happen. 
but I, I should say also down the road, uh, I, I, you know, all New York City, New York State, every state park systems, we need to increase the operational budgets. They're a huge part of the, of the system. In most many states, the largest assets that the you know the states have are capital, and you need to raise the operations to maintain, manage, and program. Folks out there, if you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat. Uh, let me know if you want to direct them to one of our panelists to the other, or if what you have is up for a, a, a joint discussion. While we wait for those to come in, Marta, do you want to say anything more? I just I wanted to um, reply or uh, reply to Rose's presentation of the swimming swimming instructional program swimming instruction programs at the state parks, and that is to say that under Mayor Bloomberg, uh, similar and with when Adrian Benepe was Parks Commissioner, both men being um, avid swimmers, right? There was a, <laughs> an inserted effort to start a learn to swim program at parks. Um, it may still have continued under. Um, under the current mayor, and and I was involved under the Benepe Bloomberg project, and I and it and one of the and the idea was that every second grader in New York City was going to learn to swim. There was going to be a six week program, uh, um, and every second grader would learn to swim, and that this was a public health measure, right? As it was in the New Deal, the swimming pools were public built as public health measures as well. But the, I, the point being that too many kids drowned and that, and that if children have the rudimentaries of swimming under their belts, um, they'll, uh, they'll be able to survive, uh, survive in the water. Uh, and of course, the hope is that they'll learn to love swimming as exercise and swimming as play and, and the like. But that was the logic. And this was organized through a public-private partnership. The why was part of it. There were all kinds of of other um, other agencies and 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 but the hang and there so there was a hang about bathing suits and about bathing caps and about cultural resistance to swimming, particularly from New Yorkers who hailed from the Caribbean. Uh, um, but the biggest problem was physical. The biggest problem was finding indoor pools to teach kids to swim, because there aren't that many and and. And the New Deal didn't build out indoor pools, but build outdoor pools. And so, and so I, I have to say, one of my proudest moments in my in my activism on this issue was when I got the New York City Board of Education uh, or department, I guess at that point, uh, um, the Department of Parks and Recreation and CUNY at City College to collaborate, and we managed to open the swimming pool at at City College for swimming instruction to local. To local, to a local, to local, to kids from local sc lo schools in Hamilton Heights, and I'll never forget those sessions. I'll never forget the kids coming and learn and and the ways in which the lifeguards uh, woo them to come into the pool. The kind of the joy that they had, the way their mothers watched and said, "Hmm, maybe I should learn to do this too." It was really magnetic. Uh, um, so I, we have lots of work to do, right? We have lots of work to build our public realm uh, um, and make uh, make make what we have in our city accessible to everyone. Um, but any, I just figured that I'd share that. that no, no, it's, it's really. It's, I have videos of these young girls, you know, pulling on baby bathing cats, sticking their toes in the waters, and the lifeguards saying, "Jump, you know, come on." And anyway, so I. It's a it's, it's, it's a really it's amazing fantastic program. Yeah, An amazing, amazing program, and so needed. Just to add one thought about volunteers and, and, and fitness, I, I recently participated in a project called Hike the Heights in Upper Manhattan, which was designed to get people out and walking in Upper Manhattan as a measure for public health, but also as a measure to get people out and reclaiming their streets and parks. And people walked through all sorts of different parts of Upper Manhattan and then eventually converged on one park in Washington Heights. This year's wrinkle was that it was hybrid. You could hike in Upper Manhattan or you could hike somewhere else and send in pictures of where you were hiking. And it, it, we, we just hit on it as we were doing it, that, that hiking and walking in general are great fitness activities and they don't require that much of a physical infrastructure to get started. 
and we took advantage of existing parks and streets and 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 the impact was really good it's been going on for more than a decade now and i think it's really made northern manhattan a happier and healthier place let me pass along a question that came in um that that came through you know robert caro talks about the way moses is built the infrastructure that served Jones Beach with limited mass transit access. Maybe New York City was just less amenable to physical segregation when considering Moses' racist tendencies. The questioner asks, how do you deal with the legacy of that in transport? It's something that Rose talked about, about making Jones Beach more accessible right. through the combination of train and bus. That's how I got there for a long time. Right. Can you say more about the work that you did to sort of sometimes undo Moses' legacy or expand on Moses' legacy? In terms of state parks? Um, yeah. Well, uh, Robert Moses um, has, there many people have very strong feelings about Robert Moses um, and some like him and some don't. And so for instance, um, to undo a Robert Moses legacy, Niagara Falls um, is the uh, Robert Moses Parkway that basically separated the communities from the Niagara River Gorge. And uh, what we did was we spent $40 million and we removed that parkway um, and planted it and put benches and gave access uh, to the river. So. That's kind of undoing. Um, in terms of, of expanding upon his legacy, uh, you, you know, the architecture of Jones Beach is magnificent. And uh, we did a lot of research as, I mean, we are rebuilding for even more. I think I put up there 70 million, it'll be 90 million. And we're keeping a, a lot of uh, uh, we are restoring the, the majesty uh, of that. Uh, Robert Moses was, um, uh, you know, it's the famous story and it's true. Uh, those bridges were too, too low uh, for buses. So that would prevent uh, the, along the parkway and, you know, we own the parkway, parks do. And, um, so we, through public transportation, have you know gotten around it, but also uh, we have made sure that uh, buses can go around the bridges now uh, that are too low, so that everybody gets to come. And then, uh, you know, with with Jones. Beach being just the obvious example, uh, you know, we are bringing everybody there. Jones Beach is about, gosh, I can't remember, but I think it's around 7 million visitation. Um, and I would say 65% is from Queens or Brooklyn or, you know, communities that don't have access. And boy, are we increasing that access. Uh, we're gonna do everything we can, which is not the Robert Moses legacy, but we're using the Robert Moses structure to do it. Marta, you wanna say anything? Yeah, I just would say that I, I think that I admire Rose's, Rose's answer to that question and not only Rose's answer, but what Rose did uh, um, in terms of, but I think I think the point is there's a double-edged point here, which is that we need the physical in infrastructure, right? And that we have the infrastructure and when we need to fix it to make it more accessible because it was built imperfectly. Uh, um, and and so I, I just would say that with, I don't know the answer to this question, but I haven't researched it. Um, but I know that landscape historians bitterly debate the charge that the, the, the bridges were built to, um, Bridges were built with racist intent. They may, they definitely had racist consequences, but it's not clear, not clear to me that they were built with racist, with racist intent. And I'm much more interested in addressing the consequences, which is where I think, which is why I find Rose's answer so, um, so inspiring. 
I would also say that there's plenty of history, oral history that's been done, some of it by me and some of it by other people, Sharon Zukin comes to mind, talking about the ways in which you didn't need a state actor to make a recreation facility segregated or to incur, to, you, 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 the, the racism that bathers and users of public rec recreation experience was enacted by people on the ground in the sites themselves. And so um, I just would caution us from deflecting our attention to, the, to the, either the savior or the demon, the man in charge, rather than to ourselves or to more, uh, um, and to the, 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 the system of our society that encourages and permits and allows racism to occur in the ways that it does and the ways that it damages kids in particular. So uh, that's a really, that, that in my view is where the problem, the problem lies is that we need to change who we are uh, um, and what our values are in order to create the world um, that we want, uh, um, or at least that I think the people uh, on this panel want. Not everybody in America does, uh, as we know all too well from the past uh, couple of years of experience. I just wanted to um, uh, answer, uh, respond to Gray Brecken's point, hi Gray out there in, in Zoom world, that um, to, to say yes, that yes, PWA sewage treatment plants did make rivers far more safer, including in New York City. This was another great Moses uh, contribution was to build sewage treatment plants. Uh, we build them differently now, but they started, uh, they, they were, um, they were uh, many of them were built um, in the city and in this city through Parks and Rec and then also in other cities. And again, this was a New Deal project that was formed to employ workers, to get Americans back to work, to, and in doing so, to make America a better place and healthier place um, to be. We, will, we, we, we need that. <laughs> we need people to believe this, um, to, to act on these kinds of, um, act on these kinds of values, absolutely. Um, uh, but for Moses, the pools and the sewage treatment plants all were integrated. They were all part of his, of his vision, which was thoroughly, thoroughly, um, thoroughly top down. Um, uh, a question, a comment really from Jeff Gold. Do the panelists have any thoughts on what might be called reclaimed parklands or other natural areas as we rethink highways, parking lots, and other concrete manifestations of our earlier orientations and interests? Let me just speak to that briefly. I think of Fawnstock State Park in the Hudson Highlands and my, my colleague, Alec Gates at Rutgers Newark talked about how if you went to what is now Fawnstock in 1900, you would have seen an environmental disaster area, burned over forests, charcoal pits, abandoned iron mines. A New Deal CCC camp was central to rebuilding that area and turning it into a state park. And I'm pretty sure under Rose's tenure is when that park took a giant leap forward and became an absolutely superb cross-country skiing facility that I use with great pleasure in the winter and that I hike at in the summer times. Any other thoughts about repurposed lands that you'd like to share? Um, well, I, I, I do, as I said earlier, with the F, FDR and planting, a, you know, a, a million trees and with Fawn, Fawn stock, um, yes, and that, that uh, a whole, uh, we inherited the, the reclaimed land and, and just embellished uh, what was already there. Uh, you, you know, um, Riverbank's an example. Yep. Uh, you know, top it, it when built, it was built. I don't know, 24 years ago, it was the world largest garden, <laughs> rooftop garden, or park. Uh, but and uh, parking lots. Uh, this goes actually to state parks and the new city parks. We're and to Mayor Bloomberg an initiative of. We are taking large asphalt parking lots, uh, ideally adjacent to schools or some entity that can anchor them, removing the asphalt and creating parks adjacent to schools for kids. And under Mayor Bloomberg with Trust for Public Land, when I was there, uh, we built 200 and they weren't small, uh, 200 of these parks. The landfills, um, we opened uh, right before I left Shirley Chisholm State Park, and that's in Brooklyn. It was a labor of love 
uh, but it was uh, to basically serve the health need of central Bro Brooklyn that has uh, a huge percentage of diabetes, obesity, asthma. It's 400 acre landfill. And uh, we converted it from a landfill to a park. It's open, fully open today. It's 408 acres of, uh, you know, on Jamaica Bay. We have a closing time of 8.30 p.m. I want to off, we have, don't have any questions in the chat right now. So I want to start with Marta. Any final thoughts that you want to share? I, I just uh, wanted to just reply briefly to Jeff's comment and to say, to Jeff Gold's comment, which, which is to say that, uh, again, thinking back to the Bloomberg administration, there was great, um, I believe, I'm not a big fan of Michael Bloomberg, but anyway, but, um, but in this way I am, and to, to think about uh, the, the points that Jeanette Sandvik Khan, the transportation commissioner made, about 30% of what I heard this at a presentation at City College, and she said 30% of New York's open space, um, or 30% of the space in New York consists of roads and streets. This is and what we, what we need to do is to think about ways to reuse the open space that we own. It's public space. And, um, and she's located her uh, small parks, the small parks project, project, the turning of triangular parks made at, the, made at the various intersections in Midtown. She located the bicycle routes in all in this idea of thinking about how can we take what we have uh, figure out how to work with uh, work with it from a, a bottom up incremental in an incremental way to augment um, public space and to green public space in in a city that is um, that is dramatically dramatically overbuilt. Uh, I, I thought it was brilliant. Um, I said, you know, we just don't need to let the trucks run it, you know, and and we also need to figure out how to share it. Again, coming back to a point. Um, I made I made just a few minutes ago about the ways in which treasured public resources such as recreation need we need to figure out how to share them uh, um, and I think in our in our planning for them now coming to a, a point of of conclusion I think we also need to think about how we maintain them as well as how we build them because so much of the crisis that we face with parks is and other kinds of recreational facilities is the fact that when we make them, we don't build into our thinking of the making of them, who's going to take out the garbage? Who's gonna fix the broken paving? Who's going to make sure the water's clean? Who's gonna do all that work? And, and how can that um, kind of operational mentality be built into the vision, uh, be, be built into the vision from, uh, from the beginning? Uh, I think it's, it's crucial because of course, that's essential to maintaining the public realm. It's also, there are also jobs involved in those uh, projects, right? So. Rose, any final thoughts? Uh, I think Marta said it all. It, <laughs> <laughs> oh. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's about stewardship and um, maintaining and, and taking what you have and uh, uh, revitalizing and transforming and making it relevant to where you are in time in the 21st century. I want to thank both of our panelists and everyone who showed up tonight. This has been a project of the New York City chapter of Living New Deal. And the next slide that you see up is going to have our contact information on that. If you're interested in our work, if you're interested in the New Deal, if you want to move forward from here, get that contact information down and uh, we'll be happy to work with you going forward. I want to thank everybody who came out tonight and everybody on our panel. And I want to just say how much I appreciate the work that everybody's doing. Can I ask one last question? Sure. I wonder among the people who attended this panel, how many people learned to swim in a New Deal pool? I did. So mm. I, I learned to swim in a story of park pool and I remember it vividly. My father taught me how to swim. So I wonder how many of us learned to swim in a New, in, in a new Deal pool? How much, how, for how many of us is the New Deal vision of modern childhood something we experience viscerally as children? Something to think about, right? As we move. Yes, on. yes, so, yes, so. yes. So let's get that final slide up there and, and we'll...
Here it comes. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank, Thank you very you much. Bye-bye. Good night. Okay, are we done? Yeah.